Okay, so I've started up the recording as well. Okay, so today's lecture will have uh, two goals to it. Um, the first goal is to uh, finish up the discussion of uh, trade-offs between uh, individual-based modeling and aggregate modeling. We started this discussion last time, and we're going to be continuing on um, to finish it off, particularly with an emphasis on discussing some of the trade-offs in place right now because of the, the current state of tools. I'm going to be speaking about that in part because that's something more readily under our control. We talked already about some fairly inherent trade-offs between the methods, and we'll review those in just a moment. But um, there's also some uh, trade-offs between doing individual-based modeling on the one hand and, and system dynamics or, or aggregate level modeling on the other that um, are really reflections um, that are somewhat more artificial, reflections of the current state of the art in software within each of those areas. In a way, those are a historic accident, although they, they do reflect some of the um, uh, the issues of what's harder and what's easier in each domain. So we're going to be talking about this, and then we're going to go on to a quite different subject. Uh, we're going to be going on to discussion of how these methods can be applied together with, with hybrids. And I, in fact, I sent you just before class um, some models that we'll be discussing, some hybrid models um, that hybridize different approaches supported by any logic that we'll be discussing here in class uh, today uh, and as, as required uh, the beginning of, of next class. So just as a reminder, we started to talk about uh, individual-based or agent-based um, and aggregate modeling. So agent-based and individual-based on the one hand, fo focusing on individuals. And um, we noted that aggregate models uh, are much simpler from the standpoint of having fewer, much fewer, much less state to store away, far fewer state variables, so variables that are changing over time, driven by internal model dynamics, many fewer parameters. And typically there's far fewer of them than there is number of people in the population. By contrast, individual-based models, uh, when we're dealing with models of human populations, we're often going to have state variables and parameters that are proportional to the model size. Now, um, as we've learned, we'll often build uh, multi-scale models where agents are not limited to individuals. They may also represent, for example, schools, may represent um, neighborhoods, may represent cities, et cetera. And um, even in that case, though, we still have this, this fundamental division that individual-based models tend to have a lot more moving parts a lot more state that has to be stored stored up. So we contrasted these models in terms of their granularity. And we talked about some of the trade-offs in place uh, between these models after reflecting on the fact that typically it's not the nature of the situation that forces one of these approaches, but rather the questions we're bringing to bear. Um, uh, our degree of access to understanding of how things play out at the individual or the aggregate level. Um, aspects of, of whether the, the policies, for example, we want to examine need to depend on individual history, etc. So we talked about some benefits that are more or less inherent between these sorts of modeling. And I'd like, I'd like you folks to, to remind us of some of these trade-offs. Where what are some of the reasons that we might prefer an aggregate model? Okay. Um, sorry? Okay, an aggregate model can capture heterogeneity. How do we do that in an aggregate model? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You have to keep separate stocks. Uh, in, in fact, if, if we have a, a set of stocks that represent the population divided by healthcare status, maybe it's people without diabetes and people with diabetes. If we want to, if we want to capture males and females, what do we have to do? 
Suppose we had those without diabetes, those with diabetes, and those with diabetic complications, say, um, and those with um, heart disease or, or kidney disease. And now we want to keep track of people according to their sex within the model, um, male or female. How, what would we do? Conceptually, what would we do? What's it? That needs to make a copy of the entire model. Right. Conceptually, that's what goes on. Now, in fact, the tools that are out there um, make this process easier from a visual standpoint and from a uh, an operational standpoint, um, involving less cutting and pasting, involving less sort of clutter in your diagram, by allowing you to use what's called subscripting. So just like... Uh, in a mathematical equation, you can have an x sub i, where x now represents a vector and not just a single scale or quantity, a single number, but instead a vector of numbers. Um, uh, so it is with, with these sort of subscripted uh, variables. We can have a stock that's subscripted by age, or subscripted by age and sex, for example. And that's, that's useful, but there's still a problem. And what is that problem? Under what circumstances will we still see a problem? I emphasized this a bit last time. Sure. Um, so we can subscript a model like this. We can stratify it, make copies of it according to different subgroups within the population. But I'd argue that there's a problem with that approach that you can run into. What is that problem? There's actually a couple of them. Yes, longitudinal information is very difficult to keep track of. Um, so information about a person's history. For example, did they ever get infected before? How many times? To capture how many times they got infected before, in principle, we could subscript the model by the count of times they've gotten infected before. So now we have perhaps a model with S, I, and R, or S, E, I, R, and we create, we have copies of it for people who have never been infected before, people who have been infected once, twice, three times. This would, of course, be in a model where R goes back to S. You know? um, so we could do that, but it becomes very cumbersome. And if we wanted to keep track of, you know, which particular doctor treated them previously, or um, the, the particulars of the treatment that they received, or what have you, it gets very awkward. But there's another problem, too. As the number of dimensions of heterogeneity we're interested in, the number of types of distinctions we want to capture goes up, the size of the model just blows up completely. If you want to keep track of age, sex, ethnicity, income, education level, even just sort of basic demographics, the model can become very, very large. What's more troublesome, and we didn't get a chance to get into this, but I referred to it, is that if you have progression among certain dimensions of heterogeneity, if you have changes along those dimensions of heterogeneity, representing that becomes very awkward because they start to they start to interact in strange ways. First of all, you have to represent all possible combinations of states you can be in. You could be in this state of diabetes, this state of infection, this state, this income level, this sex, this age, this ethnicity, all possible combinations, and there's the blow-up factor. But trying to represent progression along these dimensions becomes very painful. Of those dimensions I've mentioned, which of them have uh, common progressions? Which of those change? Well, surely you can answer me that. Give me one that changes of dimensions of heterogeneity I've just mentioned. Oh, come on, folks, you can do better than that. Um, a kindergarten class could tell me this. Um, okay, does does a person's ethnicity generally change during their life? No. Um, does their age change during their life? Yes. 
does their education level sometimes change during their life? Yes, otherwise this would be a kindergarten class. Um, does, okay, so one question might not come up in that context is does their sex change during, them? We'll, we'll leave that. But um, the, the fact is that some of these dimensions change. And it turns out representing people's status changing among multiple dimensions in one of these subscripted models it, it requires sort of a lattice type of framework where you can go along this direction, you can go along that direction, and uh, it becomes cumbersome, particularly if you start thinking of interactions of the progressions along multiple dimensions and so on. So that becomes cumbersome. So uh, you can, in fact, capture heterogeneity within an aggregate model, but it becomes awkward. How do we capture heterogeneity in, say, age, sex, income, uh, education level, uh, et cetera, within an agent-based model, within an individual-based model. How do we, how do we keep track of someone's, um, uh, for example, their uh, income? How do we do that? How might we do that? It's a variable. Yeah, you just have a variable. Now, if we reflect on the fact that in an aggregate model, the distinctions, the heterogeneity has to be discrete in its categories. We classify people not by exact age, but by age category, right? We capture them income, not income exact, but maybe income decile, or income quartile, dividing the set of all possible incomes up into 10 categories or four categories or what, what have you. We have to make that distinction within an aggregate model discrete because we can't subscript by continuous quantities. If we did, it would be a PDE. It would be a partial differential equation, not an ordinary differential equation underlying it. Is it possible to capture continuous heterogeneity, at heterogeneity uh, with respect to something that's a continuous variable, say income? Is that, is that possible to capture within an agent-based model? How do we do that? The variable is a double, right? Now, yes, I know, you know, ultimately computers <coughs> discrete and so on. But there's a huge difference between being able to deal with ten categories of income because the model starts to blow up, you know, uh, as, you, as the number of dimensions of heterogeneity go up, as you might have to in an aggregate model versus, you know, two to the thirty-second types of divisions or what have you of, of income. There's a huge difference in the dynamic range associated. Um, with the continuous uh, quantities as represented by floating point values is, is very, very large. So we can actually capture uh, uh, good approximations to continuously varying quantities within an agent-based model very readily, just as easily as we can capture discrete categories. Sure, we could have a category that's discrete with respect to, say, something like sex or ethnicity, but... Um, you know, we could just as easily capture a continuous quantity. How many pack years have they smoked cigarettes? What's their cumulative exposure to overweight? What was their birth weight when they were born? Capturing birth weight in an aggregate model, you could divide into categories, but you'd have to chop pretty finely to get at the sort of level of precision you might want for some analyses. So. Capturing continuous quantities is very readily done in an individual-based model, not very easily done in an aggregate model. Heterogeneity is associated with, with history is another aspect. Okay, so, so those are some considerations there. Give me, give me a consideration, though, which would make you attracted to an aggregate model or could make someone attracted. It doesn't have to be you. It could be your professor. What, what would attract someone to an aggregate model? What, what feature of it? What can we do with an aggregate model that it's not so feasible at this stage of our sort of analytic insight to do with an individual-based model? Yes. Very fast. So fast it can be interactive. I gave the example of a climate model foiled down to uh, foiled down from a highly disaggregated model to a 
to a simple stock and flow model that's used in simulating climate negotiations between multiple parties. And being able to run it quickly, get immediate insight as you adjust parameters is worth a lot. It can lead to a lot of policy insight that's hard to evolve at a visceral level, hard to really develop and internalize with, a, with an individual-based model that may require hours to run, or in the case of climate models, days to run, what have you. So, so this is something important. What's another thing I can do with an, uh, an aggregate model that's very hard to do with uh, a lot of individual-based models? And incidentally, I, I will say, and we're going to come back to this point, that another reason aggregate models are so much quicker to run is because you don't have to run them many, many times if they're discrete, oh, excuse me, if they're deterministic, because they always give the same results. Whereas our, our models that we're building in any logic for agent-based computation, they're stochastic. They actually give somewhat different results every time we run them. And to develop confidence about the range of variability and the average, we have to run it many times to make sure we're not just seeing a fluke through a single run, just some odd behavior. Um, so, uh, so that's a reason that, that they take, not only does one run take a lot of time, but you have to run it many times. But what's another advantage of an aggregate model? What, what other advantage might recommend it? Think about from the perspective of, of a researcher. Well, it turns out they're a lot easier to analyze. We again haven't dwelled on this in this course. In fact, it went very light on this side. But we can gain tremendous insight through analysis, through formal analysis of aggregate models. So we can understand under what situations they're in a sort of balance, in an equilibrium. In other words, when they're in a fixed point. We can understand when they're stable, under what conditions they're stable, under what conditions an epidemic will be caused by the entry of one person, under what, what circumstances the situation will resist disturbance. We can reason about an aggregate model's behavior in many cases over a wide variety of circumstances, wide variety of parameter values. We can get insights into its possible types of behavior. Now, this is only really possible, I should say, for simpler <coughs> aggregate models. And this is a philosophical trade-off you will find out there within the modeling community. Between, on the one hand, people who like to build models that are readily understood, where you can really analyze them and really deeply understand what's going on and the possible behaviors that could be elicited from that model. Another group of people would like to see models that are much more tightly coupled to observations in the world, characterizing things as they are in some particular circumstance, and really capture uh, a wide variety of patterns that we observe in a really rigorous way so that um, when we ask policy questions, they are really grounded in real world understanding of sort of things as they are. And this is a trade-off because analysis requires simplification. And you can solve often with analysis these problems exactly. You can find out exactly under what circumstances the that you know, this certain um, uh, disease-free state will be stable. So in other words, uh, under what circumstances the public health system will remain protected even if someone comes to, with Ebola to the Saskatoon airport. Uh, under what conditions it's stable. The problem is you're, you're doing that analysis on a simplified version of reality, a grossly simplified version. So we can get exact answers, deep insights, and extremely crude representations of the situation. We know exactly why that crude representation behaves the way it does. But if we're dealing with very, very grounded, textured, detailed representations of how things are in the world, often we're much more limited in sort of the deep insights we can get mathematically with them. We have to instead just run simulations. So this is a real trade-off. Do we go for a exact solution to a, to a different sort of simplified version of the problem, or do we get a rough solution to a quite exact representation of the situation? Well, I shouldn't say exact, but quite detailed representation of the situation. This is often the trade-off. And you'll find people coming off, 
are coming out in different ways. And a lot of it has to do with the research question you're trying to ask. Are you trying to build a model for insight or are you trying to build a model for prediction? Are you trying to capture down to the second decimal point trade-offs between policies or are you just trying to understand why you're seeing a certain type of behavior? Are you using it for building hypotheses as a thinking tool? These are, these are different uses of models. And if you find people from one who have one idea of the use of models in mind, they'll criticize models in the other camp saying, you know, from that frame of reference, from that sort of um, framing of the problem, they'll say these other models are no good. But they're judging it with respect to their own criteria. And it's a little bit transgressive in that sense. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit um, presumptuous to take your own terms of what you're trying to accomplish and assume that someone else is trying to accomplish the same thing. Models are built for different purposes. And one of the biggest distinctions of all is this distinction of whether you're modeling for learning, for qualitative insight, and for um, uh, just roughly trying to explain things where you're dealing with a caricature of the world, maybe of no particular situation in the world, or are you trying to quantitatively predict in a much much richer way, which requires a, a commensurately greater detail. So I listed up here some, some of the trade-offs. We, we talked about a bunch of them last time. Longitudinal data had a lot to do with it, the issue of, of, of historical data. This is really big in the health context because we do have so much data on individual behavior. And after all, if our model is trying to capture something, one of the most important things it can capture is individual behavior over time. And aggregate models are limited to cross-sectional depictions of the situation. There are hidden assumptions in aggregate models about individual trajectories, statistical assumptions, but they're often hard to elicit from aggregate models. But we did note that aggregate models are easier to construct. They're often easier to calibrate, to parameterize. We can do formal analysis on them. They're easier to understand because there's fewer moving parts particularly when you're just dealing with a two or three stock model, as someone, some people prefer. They have better performance, much better performance. And uh, these things matter because they save us time that we can then invest in model refinement and further investigation of policies. Individual-based models have better finality to many dynamics. We can capture things like memory full processes instead of memory less processes. We can capture exact timing of aging instead of dividing it up into a set of first order delays that are coupled together in an aging chain. They can provide strong support for highly targeted policy planning, targeted in terms of your location in a network, targeted in terms of aspects of heterogeneity, targeted in terms of where you live within a landscape, targeted in terms of your history of encounters with the healthcare system in the past you know, have different treatment conferred to individuals in an SDI clinic based on their past history of complaints or their past um, incident encountering of that system. Um, turns out that you can open up a wide variety of additional data to calibrate to with individual-based models because you can make use of longitudinal data. You can match individual trajectories as well as cross-sectional sort of depictions of the count of people with a certain number of status over time. You can match that sort of data, but you can also match data on individual progression. So again, the distinction here, cross-sectional data, depicting the breakdown of the population at different points in time with who's in what state. Excuse me, the count of people in what state. But it doesn't link, oh, a person who was in state X at time T, T sub A, and state Y at time T sub B, is that the same person or a different person? It, it doesn't link that. Just a breakdown of the population at different times. Um, we don't know if it's the same person or a different person. Longitudinal, you're following individuals over time. Individual-based models, we have greater flexibility with respect to heterogeneity. Um, we can capture continuous variables, for example. We can examine finer grain consequences of, of things, such as network spread. And we can have a simpler descriptions of causal mechanisms. Any questions on this before I go on to, uh, to some more pragmatic considerations in terms of trade-offs between, uh, in terms of the software frameworks and work that we have cut out for ourselves 
those of us who are computer scientists. Any questions on this? Okay, so I had some key needs motivating both sorts of modeling, and both are really, really useful. Um, okay, so uh, sort of fast forward here. So we talked about, about some of these factors, um, heterogeneity and capturing, and particularly with respect to multiple domains of progression, much easier to represent at an individual level because we don't have to represent all possible combinations of states. In a, in a subscripted model, we have to represent the rules for any possible combinations of states. Age, in utero exposure, sex, ethnicity. Here, we can represent each condition more or less separately, and they can interact only at very specific places where we wish them to. So we can represent health conditions. Each one classifies an individual with respect to that particular health condition, and we don't have to represent all possible combinations of them. Um, okay, um, yeah, so we can uh, capture, uh, capture phenomena across networks and in space. A very important issue that I didn't dwell on, but I've mentioned before, and I'll just emphasize here, frequently you're concerned about phenomena at a variety of scales, institutional level, individual level, interinstitutional, aggregated level. Um, and this has been depicted in, in many ways. This is from Glass and, and uh, McAtee um, from Social Science and Medicine, where they're classifying sort of things within an individual and outside of an individual at larger and larger areas. And there's been talk about you know, really evolving and understanding at a multi-scale level about what's going on from the uh, metabolic network level, le level of biological pathways, up to level of diseases, up to level of, of uh, social behavior and, the, and epidemiology, the spread of infection and its distribution within the population. And this sort of multi-scale framework has been um, appealed to with, uh, uh, for many problems, including in this case, a um, problem of, uh, related to obesity, which has a lot of impact on, on chronic diseases as, as well, it turns out, as some infectious diseases and other conditions. Um, so, um, you know, if, if we're trying to understand uh, multi-scale effects, it turns out that these are much more readily captured within an agent-based model. Uh, we can capture these, these scales, the nested context or network context within those models quite readily, as we saw from building up that city, model of cities, multiple cities, each of which had multiple individuals within it. Um, here we can capture these nesting phenomena in a way that's very comfortable to us because it mirrors the nesting we see in the world, in the broader, in the broader world. Um, uh, in terms of stochastics, aggregate models are most commonly deterministic. Um, uh, you can build aggregate models in Vensim, for example, or for that matter in any logic, stock and flow models with stochastics. We can build these models with stochastic flows. But um, very commonly, an aggregate model will be deterministic. Among other things, deterministic models are much easier to analyze. However, sometimes we want to capture those statistics because we want to reason about variability that's seen, for example, in historic data. This says in historic noise. That should really say in historic data, um, empirical observations. Um, so we may have data, for example, a number of individuals developing diabetes in different years. And we see a lot of variability and we're wondering can we account for the fact that we see sometimes it going up, sometimes it going down? Is that consistent with our hypotheses? And, and you could build a model at an individual level that's stochastic that might be able to reproduce those patterns. And you develop confidence, therefore, that your, your hypothesis of, say, rising rates can, can um, persist despite the fact that you see certain types of stochastic behavior in the historic data. Um, Individual-based models have many parameters, and estimating all of them can require a lot of effort. We're going to be talking about this probably next week in quite some detail. How do we calibrate these models? And generally, it's a, it's a tougher process with uh, individual-based models. Um, for an individual-based model, performance varies with population size. Dylan referred to this earlier. Double the population, you at least double the running time of an individual-based model. There's more agents to be simulated. 
Why might the running time go up more than double? Riddle me this. Who can who can volunteer a reason? Why might the the running time of, of an agent-based model with a population P more than double if you go to a population 2P? Caching effects? What's that? Caching? Yes. So so um, a lot of it has to do with memory hierarchy issues. That's one important reason. So those were not computer science background. It turns out that when your computer your computer can store um, can store information, for example, information the agents in your model at different places, and some of these places are much faster to access than others. It's kind of like you have a certain number of, of phone numbers in your head, you have a certain number on your phone, and then you have other numbers that are stored on the web or in a phone book or what have you. And if you have to go to look up a number online, it's going to be slower than just remembering it in your head. And so it is with a computer. Certain of the memory is very quick to access. So on core memory caches, for example, you can access them lickety split, as they say. Um, but some other places that this sort of memory could be stored are much slower. So if it's not in the processor cache, it's on the L1 cache, maybe the L2 cache, which may be slower, maybe by a factor of 10. If it's not there, maybe in main memory. If it's not in main memory, it may be where, folks, from computer science background? If it ain't in main memory anymore and you have virtual memory, it may be on your disk. Yeah, and of course it could be on the the cache memory from that disk, or it could be in the actual on the actual disk. And the actual disk, if you have to go to your disk for that information, it may take 10,000 times, and it's probably longer these days. Maybe it's 100,000 times as long as to get it from the fastest memory on your machine, which is maybe the L1 cache in the, um, in the microprocessor, or indeed, if it were in a register. So... Huge differences, and it turns out computers can only store so much in each of those levels, and it just dumps it down to a lower level if it can't store it there. So if it can't store it in main memory, it pages it to disk. It goes out to disk. And so if you more than double the size, it may not be able to fit much more in main memory, put it to disk, and, it, and the performance grinds to a halt. Well, not to a halt, but it gets much, much, much slower. This can be a sudden effect. Suddenly, the performance takes a lot, the computer performance takes a hit, and it takes a lot longer to run. What's another reason, though? Take, putting aside computational reasons, suppose all computation were done by professors sitting back in their chair in the office um, during their copious free time. Um, uh, what would still be an effect whereby doubling the population, if you were simulating things at an individual level, pen and paper, Doubling the population size might more than double the time to run a simulation. Why? Can it be with the complexity, like is unlinearly related to yeah. the size of population? Yeah. Depending. Whoa. Okay. Uh, you're speaking like a computer scientist. Um, yes, it, it scales non-linearly with the size of the population. It's O of, you know, it's, it's uh, what is it, uh, the, uh, omega of N. Um, so it rises, it rises faster than uh, the size of the population. Um, lower omega, strictly. So if you have networks of people, you now have to consider not just people, but pairs of people. Now, most networks are going to be sparser, and so it doesn't quite scale um, typically you know, with a square or anything like it. But, but it may be above of just the number of people in the population. You have to consider many pairs of individuals and so on. So, so in short, it can really take a lot longer with an individual-based model. With an aggregate model, as Dylan said, double the population. What's the impact on running, running time? Nada. It, it runs at the same speed. That's pretty significant. Go from a population of 100 in your model to a population of a million to a population of a billion. No impact, adverse impact on running time. Um, this issue is, is made more more heavyweight because we often do have to run an individual-based model um, many, many additional times. So, um, you know, I've talked about a number of what I consider sort of necessary trade-offs, trade-offs that, that relate to the inherent nature 
of representing things at an individual level or at an aggregate level. I'd like to talk now about pragmatic trade-offs. And this is going to be a shorter discussion. We're going to go on to hybrid models in just, uh, just a little bit. But I want to talk about what I consider the state of the art in two different areas. One with aggregate model with traditional system dynamics packages. And, and actually, any logic supports this uh, on the right as well. And then, on the other hand, um, any logic and agent-based modeling right here. Um, so um, current package deal is um, that uh, you know traditional system dynamics packages um, do support actually individual based modeling using subscripting. Stretch your minds, ladies and gentlemen, for a moment if they're not already stretched to the to the breaking point. Hopefully they're not entering the plastic regime where they're going nonlinear. Um, I'll have to exert a damping function if that's true. Um, stabilize the situation if the eigenvalues go above zero. Um, okay, so uh, how would you, through subscripting, support individual based modeling in something like Bensim? If you wanted stocks and flows for every individual in the population, what could you subscript those stocks by? By individual number. So individual one stock. They have a stock of their glycemic level. And individual two has a stock of their glycemic level. You can subscript by individual. That gets very awkward if you have a dynamic population. People being born and dying and so on. It doesn't work so well if you need to connect them in networks. You'd have to represent an, a, a matrix of, of networks. It's O of n squared. But by and large, system dynamics packages, traditional packages like Vensim, PowerSim, um, I think and Stella um, that are out there, um, they actually provide quite a lot of very useful features. The one I want to emphasize the most is that they provide a declarative way of specifying the model. I think there's, there's one person in this class that has had the um, fortune or misfortune, as, as one might have it, of taking my class 470 or 816. Those of you uh, elsewhere in this class have perhaps been spared because um, I, I was on sabbatical last year, and <coughs> others of you might avoid it like the plague anyway. What do I mean by declarative specification? What distinguishes a declarative specification as opposed to uh, a non-declarative one? Crudely speaking, I'm looking for a very rough sense. If you specify something declaratively, you're concentrating on the what and less the how. You're just saying what you want to hold. You're specifying sort of what you're describing, and you're letting the software figure out the how. And I would argue that Vensim does this quite well. There's other, there's other pieces of software that we use almost day to day that also do this well. And I'll use as an example of this a spreadsheet. Perhaps you folks would be shocked if I were to tell you that a spreadsheet can be viewed as a program. A lot of spreadsheets can be viewed as specifying a program. Where's the program encoded within a spreadsheet? Where is the logic within a spreadsheet? Where's the thing that that a lot that limits sort of what values it can take on? Where do we specify those things? Where do secretaries specify them? Where do people from social science background specify them? Where do those who have never Never had the opportunity to go to, uh, to university or secondary school. Where, where would they specify these things? Where would they program the spreadsheet? Speak use. Where do you do your spreadsheet programming? In the cell? Yes. And what do you enter in the cell? You enter a formula. 
You enter a formula. You can view that as a sort of programming. It's, it's not the it's not type of programming we think of with for loops and if statements and all that sort of stuff. But it's a specification <laughs> of a set of constraints that have to hold. And they can get quite involved. If you've ever looked, used lookups or index functions or match in Excel, you might know what I mean. And yet, it's a declarative specification. It says what relationship has to hold. And who is it that takes care of achieving that? Who is it that takes care of the how? Well, the spreadsheet pack. Spreadsheet, spreadsheet software takes care of translating that in an intelligent way into a topological sort of the spreadsheet that goes through and figures out what variable has to change before what other variable, what has, what has to be calculated before what has to be calculated. In other words, the recalc. And I actually knew the guy, John Nikfonsky, who wrote that algorithm in Excel. And um, I had the, the fortune to, to work with him to test it. So, here we have a situation where, in a spreadsheet, you specify what relationships you want to hold, and it takes care of, of accomplishing that. And I would argue a similar thing is true with Vensum. What are you specifying there? What's the what you are specifying in Vensum? You're specifying the, what is it you're specifying in Vensum? You're specifying the, yeah, the structure of the model in terms of stocks and flows, right? The action is kind of where the flows are. They evolve, you know, they, the flows drive the behavior of the stocks, right? And you're, you're entering, much as you are in a spreadsheet, you're entering formulas in, right? Saying this depends on this. This flow is, is you know, alpha times this stock or whatever. The rate of this flow is alpha times this stock. Mm -hmm. So it will go through and it will figure out how to accomplish that. And, and there's a numerical integration algorithm where it figures out the consequences for the values of the SOC over time. It's notable that you don't have to specify that you know, with for loops or in, in a language that's, um, that's purely textual. You're actually specifying it declaratively and you know, specifying what relationships you want to hold in a graphical language, and it takes care of the how. Turns out this allows us to use what's sometimes called equational reasoning. We're basically using mathematic, mathematical reasoning. We don't have to worry about which variable was initialized where and what executes before what within this, within this diagram. That's all hidden. We can reason about things at a mathematical level. And that's very powerful. Turns out that there's also metadata that's that's supported. So we haven't gone into it in this class, but online you'll find you'll find lectures by me um, on the issue of doing unit checking, for example, and in Venson. And to address a question from a student, um, this is very powerful. So, ladies and gentlemen, suppose we have a stock. And this is a stock, perhaps, of some sort of quantity. We'll call it dimension X, where X might be person, right? Right? And suppose that our time unit of our model is day. If we have this stock of persons, what must the unit be by which we measure the outflow of that stock, or for that matter, the inflow. If we measure things in persons for the number of people in the stock, say it's the number of people with diabetes, and now we want to consider the number of people dying with diabetes, what must be the unit associated with that flow? If we're measuring time in days, this would be this flow would be what? Person per day. That has to be the case for this to be dimensionally consistent. Among other things, it's going to integrate up that flow. If we represent this flow, we call it F, and we call it you know, F of T, because it may be changing over time. This is persons per day. This stock, 
you know, the value of the stock, we, we could write it down as, you know, D person, so we'll call it DP, DT, equals, you know, some, um, some value for this, F, F of, of T, right? And so DP equals F of T times DT. And so DT is in, if time is measured in days, DT is measured in days as well. It's just one time minus another time, so it's days. So we're multiplying the value of this flow times the time to get the change in the value of the stock. This delta P equals, I mean, it's a pro, we could approximate it with this. Delta P, the change in the number of people in the stock, excuse me, this is F minus F of T times delta T. So F of T has to have units of person per day to be multiplied times thing measured in days to give us a thing measured in persons, which is the change in the number of persons. Does that make sense to people? Okay, and this is why, ladies and gentlemen, when you build these models, you can always, it's a bit of a digression, but I'm doing this for an artful purpose. Um, this is why in these models, you can always do unit checking to quickly arrive at an understanding of how do you treat like a mean time with disease and how do you treat a coefficient, a chance per unit time of leaving. If you have a mean time with disease, and this is measured in days, so now maybe we're dealing with, I don't know, influenza, number of days you're infectious with influenza. If I have a mean time you're infectious, which is measured in days, and I have a count of people who are infectious, and I want to figure out how many people are recovering per unit time, Give me the formula for this. So I have a, 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 a mu, which is measured in days, and I have a stock, call it P, which is, uh, is persons. What is the formula for first order delay? What's the formula for this outflow? Is it P divided by mu or P times mu? <coughs> what does it have to be dimensionally? Yeah, it has to be p divided by mu to have a to have a dimension of person per day, right? It has to be. If we multiply it times mu, we're getting person days leaving, and that doesn't compute. We'll compute numerically, but it's meaningless. It's senseless. It's nonsensical. It's semantically garbage. To, to count a number of people and have things going out that are person days. So, so this flow has to be in persons per day. And the way we achieve that is dividing persons by the mean number of, of days. So that, that is the thing which is consistent. Conversely, folks, if we had a coefficient of leaving of one, of one over mu, we'll call it alpha, what is the unit of this? What's the unit of 1 over mu? It is, well, if mu is in days, 1 over mu is 1 over days, right? Um, or per day, you could think of it as. Um, and that's the, that's the dimension of alpha. That's the chance per unit time that you're leaving. Because chance is measured as, as a unit dimension. It's, it's dimensionless. It's, it's unit dimension, 1. So it's this chance per day of leaving, 1 over mu. And we could, if we have alpha, what do we do with it to get a first order delay here? Do we divide it or multiply it? This is a dimension one over day. So what do we need to do in order for it to be consistent with the flow having dimension person over day? Yeah, so, if, so if, if we have a mu, we divide P by mu to get the number of people leaving. If we have an alpha chance per day of leaving, we multiply p times alpha. Because now we're multiplying persons times something that's of dimension one over day, and we again get something that's person over day leaving. Persons per day leaving. So, so these are these two different forms of this. And alpha is just one over mu. You can go between them. Um, the chance per day of leaving is one over the mean time with that infection for a first order delay. 
So dimensionally, dimensions tell us a lot about what has to be the case here. And they should guide us. When you look at a model like this and you're thinking, okay, I have a mean time with disease. Do I multiply by it or divide by it? You have to divide by it to get persons per day going out. If you have a chance per unit time of leaving, it's a chance per day, and you have to multiply by it to get persons per day leaving. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I'm saying is then some checks this for you. It can check this for you. If you tell it the units associated with different quantities, it will double check all your units are correct. You'll make sure you're not dividing by an alpha or multiplying by a mu. It can check all that for you. It's very powerful in that sense. It allows you to, when you run events a model, there's output produced, and you can go back and reflect on that output six months later. You could go back and check out the runs we built with Vensum a month or more ago now, because those, those things are, are saved away. So Vensum actually is a very powerful tool for hiding a lot of the programming. And that's one of the reasons it's so popular. Now, any logic, on the other hand, which I consider the state-of-the-art agent-based modeling platform, um, I mean, the repast is, is getting very good. But in terms of declarative support, any logic is well beyond it, in terms of sort of the sophistication of, of the what. what. Give me a declarative mechanism within any logic, a mechanism that allows you to more specify the what, and it takes care of the how. When I build up an any logic model, certainly I have to do some Java coding from time to time. And there's little snippets of it, little bits of it here and there. But where is a place that I can more describe the what and more focus on the what? Focus on describing the situation, you know, what is the case, and it will take care of take of all the details of it, or most of the details of it. There's actually quite a few cases of this. Give me some examples. Excellent. Excellent. How about, how about another one? We introduced it briefly at one point. Statistics. Do you remember how we how we told it to add a statistic to a population? How do we do that? We go to the population. We do add statistic. We tell it what do we want it to do. Do we want it to sum something up? Do we want it to take the mean of something? Take the max? Take the min? And then we tell it what expression to use, and it takes care of the how. So those are some examples. But how about in terms of describing behavior? Maybe behavior of an agent, for example. How do we describe an agent's behavior in a more declarative way in any logic? We could write agent code. We could write some Java code to make the agent do odd things. But how might we commonly describe behavior of an agent? Give me two mechanisms. State chart. State chart. We could diagram out a state chart. We have to fill in little bits and pieces, just like we do fill in formulas within Vensim or formulas in a spreadsheet. But it basically takes care of the how. In most agent-based modeling packages, you would write the Java code to do that state chart, to implement the state chart, um, which is, for someone from computer science background, not terribly hard, but it's error-prone. It can be buggy, and it's hard to change. It's harder to change, and it's harder to visualize. If you look at a bunch of Java code, even someone who's spent much of their life writing Java code, there's a lot more interpretation that has to go on to turn it into your understanding in terms of a state chart about what's going on. And a state chart allows you to describe that. How about another mechanism for describing individual behavior in any logic that could be applied in an ancient level? Well, events you could use, for example. You could describe an event. You'd say whether you want the event to be a one-time event or an ongoing event, how often to go up, is it based on a rate, is it based on a, on a uh, uh, condition, or is it based on some sort of timeout. Once again, it's declared. That's pretty good. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive. But there is Java code that you have to write, um, sometimes quite a bit. <coughs> if I wanted to create a, 
a model which involved uh, quite sophisticated rules for individual mixing between individuals. There probably be quite a bit of, of, of Java code just to have partner change implemented right, et cetera. Um, there's little or no explicit mathematical semantics here. I would encourage anyone who builds, uh, builds an any logic model to think about having a separate specification of it that specifies sort of what it is that agents are doing so that you're not merely reduced to looking at the, at the, um, uh, the actual model within any logic. It's algorithmic um, and, and, and imperative in its specification, much, much less declarative, fully declarative than in uh, the Vensim side. And um, you, you can capture uh, discrete and continuous rules in state uh, quite nicely, but there's very little metadata. They've recently enlarged it so you can keep unit data, and I think there's some unit checking which may be supported. It would be nice if, if you could more thoroughly comment um, additional, additional elements of it. So I have some slides here, which I think I'll, I'll skip in the interest of time here. Um, but which talk more about some of the trade-offs associated with these things, whether you have implicit or explicit mathematical semantics associated with your model, um, the issue of declarative versus um, uh, imperative specifications, the how versus the what, um, and, uh, and the degree to which um, modularity is supported. Let me ask this, folks. Within current... So which... Which package do you consider more modular? Any logic or Venson? So if, if I were to build up an aggregate model in, in Venson with stocks and flows, what are what are the options for modularity there? Could I could I build a model out of pre-existing pieces? <laughs> That's right. So it's basically copy and paste modularity. You can copy from one model to another. And that's a brutal sort of modularity. Brutal in the sense of if there's a bug, you copy the bug too, and then you have to go back and fix it in two places. Maybe detect it in one, you forget to fix it in the other three places it lives. Where if, if it's modular, we can make use of pre-existing pieces and keep the definition only at one place. So actually, we can do that much more readily within any logic. After all, it's built to top Java. We can build modular systems within within Java. Um, so it's a little bit easier to do. There's still limitations on it. For example, we can't easily share a given agent class between multiple projects. Um, yeah, data and models is not merely numbers. It has meaning. The meaning relates to its dimension sometimes. Is this a person per day thing? Is it a person thing? Um, but we also might want to associate other information with it. Degree of uncertainty. Where did it come from? The provenance of this data. Where did this value? Um, so just this morning, Dylan was asking me um, about a model. You know, Where did this data, uh, what is this data? Where did it come from? That's metadata. That's, that's information that could be stored with the data, but all packages have limited support for that right now. You might be able to put in some comments, and that's good practice, but, but they have limited ability to sort of trace around in your model what the, you know, what the source of the data was, the degree of uncertainty on it. Um, turns out that, um, that there's some real potential for defining, um, defining uh, rich, uh, rich algebras, which could aid in model building, would capture some of the sort of semantics associated with, uh, with different variables. Um, for example, flag a variable if the data depend, if, if its value depends on data that's more than a certain age old or that had a source outside a certain level, et cetera. Um, so, you know, uh, it would be very desirable if packages move towards a situation where more data can be stored. Right now, Vensim and packages within the system dynamics world are better, but still not very good for storing metadata like unit and dimensional information. I um, think, think we'll leave, um, leave this. Um,
Okay, so some central points. There, there's some big differences between agent-based modeling and, and aggregate modeling as used by traditional system dynamics. These differences do have significant impact on model results in the modeling process. Both, advantage, both traditions have strong advantages in addressing different sorts of problems. And, um, and you know, I think uh, painting, painting these as two opposing, um, opposing techniques is really doing a disservice. We need to ask what does each do well and how can we use them effectively together? How can each learn from the other? Um, I think I'm going to leave that um, right now and I'm going to go into an issue that we're going to start on a uh, discussion of, of hybrid modeling. So um, I'm going to switch over right now to uh, a different presentation here. Um, on hybrid uh, system science methods. And this is, uh, we're gonna be able to spend a lot less time in it. We'll spend about the next 15 minutes. So this, this lecture is going to focus on how do we use these, te to these techniques together? System dynamics, agent-based, but also some other techniques. Um, and my view here, and, and I'm one of a few people really exploring this, um, should be careful. There's more and more actually these days, but, um, I've certainly been, been interested in this for, for many, many years, how these techniques work together. And my own viewpoint is that they're highly complementary. Different modeling methodologies seek to answer different types of questions, and no one system science methodology offers a replacement uh, for the other. And there's real synergies that can be secured by combining these methodologies. And one of any logic's most powerful features is the ability to combine these methodologies within a single model. So, in our work, we found it really beneficial to co-evolve multiple models, of uh, some built in Vensim, some built in AnyLogic, but also to use multiple techniques within a simple, uh, within a single model. So I'm going to be talking uh, for the next ten or so minutes, and then subsequently on Tuesday about using jointly several types of modeling techniques. Okay. Um, they include, uh, on the one hand, um, system dynamics and agent-based modeling, also discrete event modeling, and uh, social network analysis and decision analysis. Um, I recognize that uh, decision analysis we've only touched on a bit. Social network analysis we've touched on a little bit, a little bit more, but um, excuse me, not at all. Excuse me, in this in this class, but uh, we'll. Uh, we'll be discussing that a little bit, how it relates to some of these techniques. So the first, first thing I'd like to talk about is how system dynamics and agent can be used in support of agent-based modeling. Um, and there's a couple of different ways. One, level, one way is that high-level system dynamics models can be used to drive global dynamics of a model with agents in it. By global dynamics, I mean it could, it could describe, for example, um, uh, climate change, or could describe weather progression, uh, where we have within the model a bunch of agents that are then subjected to that weather. Or maybe the system dynamics model describes evolution of, of policy-related uh, factors, for example, the degree to which certain rules are enforced. And it describes these as dynamics over time. Perhaps it's uh, dynamics associated with availability of vaccines. So. Um, the, the available stockpile of vaccines. So that's described in a, at a, with a system dynamics model with stocks and flows, and then individual agents are vaccinated. So here we would have vaccine uptake, or excuse me, vaccine uh, delivery associated with flows, vaccine um, delivery to individuals, vaccination occurring to agents and associated with an outflow from a vaccine pool, you know, of, of uh, vaccine doses available, for example. Um, another way they can be supportive is um, within a system dynamics model, you might derive parameter estimates for a low-level agent-based model. So you actually use a high-level model to arrive at some estimates and then plugged into a, an agent-based model. Um, in some Cases it can be used to focus agent-based exploration. You might focus agent-based exploration on areas of a system dynamics model to which it's particularly sensitive. So if you find your system dynamics model very sensitive to assumptions about one particular aspect of the model, 
you might then perform an agent-based model that looks at that issue in greater detail. Maybe it's the contact rate. And so you build a little uh, agent-based model related to uh, interagent contact. Another way is by using system dynamics within agents. And we're going to see that in just, uh, just a minute here. In fact, for those who have laptops, I would suggest that you go and you open up um, a model there called CTL state variable version 4 that I would have sent to you um, uh, earlier, uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, so if you could open that up, um, that will allow us to, um, to quickly sort of transition over to that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it uh, right now. And this is under example models, and this is CTL state variable four. There we go. Um, uh, okay, discard and open virtual. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, so here we have stocks and flows within an agent that are driving continuous elements of agent evolution. Okay. Um, so agents are evolving in a continuous fashion, or at least partially continuous fashion. In another situation, system dynamics model can be used to capture the dynamics of lower interest populations or infrastructure in ABM for areas of greatest interest. So suppose you had a model, for example, of, um, uh, of diabetes within Saskatchewan. That's an agent-based model for, of diabetics. And you don't want to have to simulate the broader population at an agent-based level. You don't want to simulate the full million population within Saskatchewan. You can actually have a system dynamics model that simulates things through until the development of diabetes. And then you could have um, those, those agents developing diabetes. Excuse me. You could have the flow of people developing diabetes translate into producing a bunch of agents that are diabetic agents. And those agents could then be tracked in great detail. So here you would have stocks and flows for the region of the population that was of less focus and agents for those regions of great focus, of, of, of particular focus. Um, I should note system dynamics methodologies also has a rich tradition of di qualitative diagramming and, um, and uh, particularly the use of, of causal loop diagrams. So um, we're going to also talk about agent-based models in support of system dynamics. So agent-based models can be used to cross-validate system dynamics um, models. Um, for example, you might create an agent-based model, run it, and see if the system dynamics model needs to be stratified by a further heterogeneity uh, category. You might examine the impact of stochastics on model results and with an agent-based model, and then put it aside and continue on with a system dynamic Model, or the impact of network dynamics, um, or of network assumptions, assumptions regarding network structure. Um, so um, another, another sort of situation is you could have agents within a model driving flows within a higher level system dynamics model. I actually alluded to this earlier with my vaccine example. So suppose we have, ladies and gentlemen, in our model, of, um, of some infectious disease, we have a vaccine pool, a vaccine stockpile. And those vaccines arrive from the supplier, perhaps Roche Pharmaceuticals or some other company, and they are then delivered to individuals. There might be an inflow to that that's described by industrial processes and considerations. And the outflow associated with administration would be driven by agent dynamics. Who is receiving the vaccination at the agent-based level? And that might be based on issues having to do with um, the efficiency of processing individuals within clinics, et cetera. So it could be quite complex, but the flows are encoded, the number of vaccine doses available are encoded within S excuse me, the, the, that's a stock with NSD, and the flow would be driven by agent dynamics, potentially also uh, discrete event dynamics. Um, and um, we might also use an agent-based model to investigate specialized interventions, for example, those that depend on individual history. Um, and finally, you might use it to determine parameters for a system dynamics model. So I'd like you to open up the CTL state variable 
and I'm going to just go switch to it. Uh, um, uh, so Neil, can you see my any logic here? Okay. Um, so I'm going to um, go down and uh, I think it's uh, the last uh, model here. Yep. Yeah. And uh, let's let's just run this this model and then we'll explain a little bit what we see. So we'll go and run this thing. And what we see is uh, individuals. They're hitched up in a ring, and um, we see uh, individuals uh, exhibiting um, unusual behavior, um, shown with sort of bright flashing lights. And uh, we see, moreover, a graph below, which is actually summarizing up over the entire population, I believe, the sum of virus levels within these individuals. So these individuals were in a network here. That's what sort of network, ladies and gentlemen? What sort of network is this? Speak, use in a Greek chorus. That's a ring. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fell short of a Greek chorus, but but it was uh, appreciated. Um, okay. So that's a uh, that's a um, model. Let's go see what's going on here. So double click on person, and what you'll see is that each person has their dynamics described by uh, a set of of state equations um, as described by a set of stocks and flows. Um, in fact, if while we were running this, and I'll, I'll, I'll run this here and, and we could go and uh, drill down into it, one thing we'll see is that within an individual, their, their levels are, are fluctuating. So here we have individuals with virus levels, uh, which, are, which are changing over time with uninfected cells and, in fact, infected cells here. Um, again, changing over time. And then with uh, Z here representing cell level of uh, uh, immunity, as described by cell-mediated immunity uh, element called cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are basically used to kill off the infected cells. So here, in short, we have a depiction of dynamics of infection within an individual. So the virus initially spreads. If we go up and we look at the virus population, um, it, it sort of accelerates uh, rapidly. The number of infected cells follow. The number of, of uh, these defensive cells, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or CTLs, that accelerates rapidly. And then they die down between infections as your immune system complement uh, is devoted to other purposes. And then once an infection occurs again, they jump up. Um, the size of this, um, uh, of this uh, circle within the diagram for the individual is set by either uh, free vi virus particles or, um, or by the um, CDLs uh, in response to it and the, the, red, the red colors by something else. The key thing here, though, is that these individuals are deriving their, uh, their infections from somebody else. And if they're in a network, they're deriving those infections from other people in the network, from neighbors. So let's go, go click up here within this diagram, and you'll see virions from neighbors here. And virions from neighbors, um, excuse me, i got to go select that, virions from neighbors. And variance from neighbors has a formula that's given by omega times total viral load of, late of neighbors. And if we go click on total viral load of neighbors, what we'll find is that it simply goes through. It deals with a situation where we have no neighbors at all. But if we do have neighbors, it loops through them. And what does it do, ladies and gentlemen? What is this doing? It is... This is the problem with code. The what is not clear, absent specification. The what is not always clear. You have to look at the how. And even if you think yourself a coding god, it takes a little bit of time to be sure you understand code when looking at it. And that's why it's so valuable often to be able to specify the what and abstract away from the how where possible. Dive down to it when you need it, but otherwise abstract away from it. What does this do? What is the function of this code? Who can describe it to me? 
briefly. Sum of viral load of all neighbors. Sum of viral load of all neighbors, and it's zero if there's no neighbors at all. And one of the best clues for that is, in fact, the name. Total viral load of neighbors. That's why naming is so important, folks, from a software engineering standpoint. It's often your gives your first sort of a chance to really understand what the what is going on without having to look at the gory details of the how. So this is summing up over all your neighbors, the viral load across those neighbors. So this, ladies and gentlemen, um, and by the way, where are these neighbors determined by? They're determined by get connections. And what does that give you in any logic? Where have we seen get connections before? What does this give you? What is get connections? Similar to get connected neighbor, it gives, gives your gives your oh come on someone guess <laughs> yeah connections in a network yeah so this is the link between this individual's dynamics and their individual the, their neighbors in the network okay let's look at one other example of this oh by the way um, you'll notice that they further so, so so let me ask this um, are these people, do they exhibit purely continuous behavior or is there a discrete aspect of their behavior as well? Uh, an aspect that's not described as a continuously varying quantity as described by a real number, but, but something that's categorical in character. Is there something, is it purely continuous or are they, do they also have some categorical sort of uh, characteristics that are evolving over time in a, in a categorical fashion? In a, in a discrete fashion. Is there something discrete here? <laughs> living and dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a living and dead. So there's, um, so so there's a, a an indication about whether the individual is, has died or whether they're still alive, which is important to determine whether or not, um, in principle, they could get infected. Right now. People are still getting affected from anyone because total viral load of neighbors doesn't check if the, the neighbor is dead, and it should, because right now that kind of means we're getting zombie infections. Um, but the point is, hey, this is just another agent in any logic. Um, we could keep track of the number of individuals. Um, well, we can keep track of individuals' discrete status as well using state charts, any number of state charts in addition to this. But what we have here is individuals whose behavior is evolving over time according to stocks and flows. And this is an example of a hybrid model. Let's take a look at another example of a hybrid model, and then we'll, uh, we'll go right, we'll go. So I'd like you to do open, I'd like you to open up the model called gridded system dynamics model, okay? Um, and and actually, there's there's one called gridded system dynamics model one two seven, um, that uh, I believe was was in there as well. Now this is a uh, a slightly different model, but it illustrates similar principles. Um, okay, yeah, this is this is kind of less. Um, excuse me, I, I I don't open the other one because this one is is not what I was. Uh, it's okay, but it will illustrate it also. But I think the other one exhibits a little bit more prettiness. Um, so uh, we're going to go down there and open it up. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, here what we have is, if we scroll down, we have patches. And within each patch, we have a system dynamics model. And... Here, what we have is, at the high level, a set of patches exhibiting behavior. What do you think is going on here? It's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Um, but each of these patches has its dynamics described by this, with the exception of there's a, a migration component here, too. Um, 
And so we have migration between patches. So if we go down and we look at this, we have net migration. And what this calls is, um, excuse me, net migration here, boom. Net migration calls get net migration rate. And get net get migration rate has a bit of code, which is quite similar. Um, so this basically iterates over each neighbor. If there's zero neighbors, it's zero migration. Otherwise, it goes over each successive neighbor, and it takes the diffusion coefficient, and it multiplies it times the difference between the number of mature specimens in the neighbor versus my number. So if there's more in our neighbor than there are here, we will get what? So this is computing the immigration rate, the rate coming in here. So if there's more, if there's more of these mature individuals within our neighbor than there are within us, what happens? We get someone Well, if there's more in our neighbor than there are in us, is this going to be positive or negative, ladies and gentlemen? This is going to be... <laughs> Hello? Uh... <laughs> positive. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, this is going to be positive. So we're going to multiply by a diffusion coefficient. We're going to add it in. And so in general... If there's more in our neighbors than there are in us, there's going to be net inflow. If there's more in us than there are in our neighbors, there's going to be net outflow from us to our neighbors. So here we have inflow based on relative numbers of these things. There's kind of an osmotic migration associated with um, you know, movement according to the density in different areas. So here what we have is actually a similar situation, what's the difference between this and that CTL state variable thing we saw earlier? What's the difference between this and what we just saw five minutes ago? This is in a what? Well, let's go look at that net migration. Ladies and gentlemen, this calls net, get net immigration rate. And this this is uh, calling off to our neighboring patches. And our neighboring patches here um, are defined by neighboring patches, get neighboring patches, okay? And get neighboring patches here is actually calling off to, well, it's actually a more complicated thing. Check if this is a, nor a toroid, but this calls get neighbor. Why is this calling get neighbor? What did this other one call? Who can remind me? What did this other other one call to get um, uh, to get the number of uh, viral loads of neighbors? What did this call? Get connections. What's the difference between the two? Anyone remember? Get neighbors is neighbors in what? In locality. Locality. It's in space. So it's getting our neighbors surrounding us, whereas Get, get connections is getting our neighbors in what? In network. It's in our network, yeah. So, so this is the same basic principle. We have agents with at least some continuous dynamics described by system dynamics, uh, stocks and flows. They are embedded here in a spatial um, topology linked up to neighbors as well as geometry. In the other case, they were linked into a network, a more irregular topology, but we have spread. We Actually, here we have migration in this model. In the other model, we had not migration, but um, uh, infection occurring. Um, so there wasn't a conservation. It wasn't like my infection goes from me to another individual, thereby leaving me with less infection. It just infects another individual. But the point is that in both cases, we have individuals whose dynamics are given by stocks and flow models, and we have those individuals coupled together 
by connections, either spatial proximity or connections within a network that allow influence to spread. And that allows us uh, a powerful way of leveraging both a system dynamics element, system dynamics elements on the one hand, and, um, and elements associated with agent-based modeling on the other, taking advantage of the ability of agent-based models to give context, network context, and spatial context. And indeed, if we were to look at this, um, we could parse this in terms of, this is a, uh, for example, um, uh, a familiar, uh, familiar element here. We have this mortality rate, and then we have uh, deaths, deaths here, and um, we have our first order delay here in terms of um, this uh, multiplying times this mortality rate, et cetera. So um, uh, what, what we have here is sort of a classic uh, system dynamics model on the one hand and uh, coupled uh, in an age-based context. So this um, mortality rate here actually looks dynamic. I, I hadn't uh, realized that, but um, it may be, may be adjusting over time. In any case, um, this is... Uh, this is an opportunity for, for um, combinations of the two techniques. So I kept you too long. Um, next time, we're going to look uh, at this in, um, at some additional levels. We'll talk a little bit about how that's done within Vensim, and then we'll talk about um, combinations of agent-based modeling and discrete event modeling as well. Okay? And uh, we'll take a look at... Um, uh, the role of, of social network analysis, um, comment on that uh, a little bit as well. So that's all for today. Um, uh, I, I've received uh, from most of you folks, maybe from all of you folks now, the um, project descriptions. So I'm going to be seeing if I can go over them in the next few days just to make sure we're on common pages. I've been meeting with a lot of you separately, so I have a pretty good sense of where you're at. But I'll see if I can look over those and um, and talk uh, talk with you about them. As I announced via email, um, I do have a conflict right now, although it's it remains to be seen if if actually um, it's going to play out because someone was feeling kind of ill. So um, uh, I've moved my office hours. So I've met with one team already. I'm meeting with another team tomorrow. But if anyone needs to meet with me, you can talk with me now for a minute or two while I'm getting packed up. But otherwise. Um, I need to make myself scarce, and we can set up a meeting for tomorrow. I have quite a few space, spaces free open, free tomorrow. Okay. Thanks very much. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that would be great. Let me just disconnect this. And um, Neil, can you? Uh, how it, was the audio okay through the session?